live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for OpenStack Silicon Valley, OpenStack SV, hashtag OSSV16 is the official hashtag. This is Silicon Angle Media is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host, Lisa Martin. Our next guest is Joe Weinman, who's a VIP influencer in the tech business, a luminary, patent holder, author, all around great guys out in the trenches. Joe, welcome to theCUBE. Thank the first you, time. delighted to be here. Yes, I've been dying to do this for years <laughs> and finally I broke through your firewall. You're now a CUBE <laughs> alumni, welcome to the exclusive club. Um, okay. We see each other all the time, certainly a lot of conferences. Um, your best-selling book, Cloudonomics, a couple years old now, but still um, really a, a pace setter really on what now people are talking about in terms of cloud economics. But at the same time, the digital transformation hype has reached an all-time high and reality for customers. They kind of get it, they see Amazon, they see mobile phones, they see Uber, they see Airbnb, they understand that there's a mandate there. They don't know what there there is yet. So what's your take on this? Because you know, people are rushing fast to build, um, yet the pressure to grow the businesses, not just cut costs, are really a big focus. What's your take? Well, I think, to your point, that's really the biggest transformation, is if you go back a few years ago, everyone was talking about how cloud is a cost optimization approach, and like we can save a few shekels basically by doing cloud. Then people started to realize, wait a minute, there's more to it than that, there's an agility angle. But what I've been arguing probably for six or seven years now is, don't look at the cost side, don't look at performance metrics, look at the fact that the world is going digital, if you're not competing as a digital business, no matter what business you were in, then you're going to miss out. And ultimately the spoils will go to those with the digital skills and capabilities to incorporate in their products and services. It's funny, digital, if you go back and ask anyone, I kind of do this at parties and, and kind of a social experiment, what does digital mean to you? Most people think, oh, the web, e-commerce. But you kind of go a, deep, a, a, a leg deeper than that. You just look at it from a business perspective, it's end-to-end -end process. Yeah, so it? actually, I look at it in several different ways, and in Digital Disciplines, the new book, this is what I cover, it's the idea that processes and resource optimization certainly has gone digital. Products have gone digital, and digital products have been around for a long time. You had like the digital watches <laughs> 30, 40 years ago, but now they're not just smart and digital, but they're connected to the cloud and ecosystems and developer communities. So the whole nature of not just the products themselves, but services, which leverage the internet of things like let's say connected healthcare yeah. with connected pacemakers, connected diagnostic machines, connected pills even, um, and then also customer relationships have gone digital. So a Netflix recommender, Amazon upsell, cross-sell, but also a Mayo Clinic that does personalized medicine or patient-specific therapies based on a massive amount of big data and a targeted recommendation engine that leverages all of that. And then the last thing that I cover is actually the innovation process where that's gone digital, whether you look at 3D printers, cloud-mediated contests and challenges, innovation networks, idea markets. Like, I just don't get, honestly, companies that are, we don't need to worry about that. That's something for our tech people. It's like, there's no tech people versus the core business. They're one and the same, and you've got to realize that. I got to ask you a question because um, at, during the keynote, Martin Casada, former Nasir CEO, then sold it to VMware now at Andreessen Horowitz. Always a great um, uh, speaker, CUBE alumni. There's a lot of haymakers out there, but he, shoot, he showed a slide that you tweeted and I retweeted on my Twitter feed that had old way, new way. And I want to ask you, because this comes back down to that, the tech people comment you mentioned. There's a new way happening, and there's an old way. At some point it'll be cannibalization, but the fact of the matter is, some people just don't get that. How do you talk to people when, when they ask you n new way versus old way? Is there a is there a way for people to understand what is new and what's old? I mean, is there a side of the street to be on? Sure, well, in my book, I actually not only came up with sort of this framework, um, which is based on the classic Michael Tracy and Fred Versima value disciplines framework for the mid 90s, but updated for the digital era. Um, but I also had the opportunity to talk to some of the industry leaders like Bill Rue over at GE, 
um, and got sort of a lot of insights as to what actually makes things work properly in the new enterprise, and it's very complex. For example, one of the common themes across, not just to Netflix, which is a tech company, but also Burberry and Nike and GE, which are equally digital tech companies, is you've got to have CEO buy-in, right? It's ultimately the CEO that takes the, you know, the risk uh, and accountability for any initiative. And uh, one favorite quote of mine is the CEO of Nike, when first presenting with, with the prototype for the fuel ban, didn't say, I want a five-year business plan, uh, and I need to know exactly what the churn is going to be four years out, and what's our profit margin. It was, how soon can we have this? Okay, and that's the kind of leap and you need that kind of commitment when it comes to budget allocation and so forth. The other thing you need though is sort of a VP middle manager level who acts as the fulcrum between the CEO vision of let's go out there and be innovative and introduce these new products and services and at a base level the technologists that understand what's even feasible and you need that fulcrum that's close enough to the action to know what's it. going on, but operationalize it and make yeah. the execution part actually fit the strategy. Or, and herd the cats, if you will. <laughs> they Along say. those lines, one of the things that I think is interesting is understanding it's not a tech problem, as you said. It's really a direction that businesses need to go in in order to survive and be competitive. Talk to us about your recommendations for the CIO collaborating with the business side, but really putting a customer-centric um, umbrella around that to drive this thing, like when you mentioned Nike, Netflix, what Disney is doing with Magic Bands, for example. What is that dynamic that the C-suite, the CEO, and uh, the business and IT need to have to facilitate that customer-first focus? Well, I, I think it's several things, and it's a, it's a great question, but that is really the whole point, and the point of the value disciplines model originally, and my digital disciplines model, it's all around delivering unparalleled customer value which is a little bit different than competitive strategy, but closely related, right? Because if you want to compete effectively, as a rule, not always, but as a rule, you've got to deliver differentiated customer values so that customers select you. Um, there are other dimensions to competitive strategy, like maybe having a cost advantage that allows you to weather price wars better, say, but that's less interesting to me. Uh, the other thing is people focus on, quote unquote, the customer experience, but there's not a lot more to the total customer value package than just the experience. So the one thing I would say is, you've got to have this co-creation of strategy effort that says, we are trying to figure out something that will really be unique and help us create differentiated advantage and therefore help us you know, create margin and market cap and allow us the flexibility to continue to innovate um, but all of that has to be grounded in the reality of technology. So you have you know, technologies that weren't ready for prime time, or um, to put this politely, there are people that jump on bandwagons without necessarily fully understanding, at least from my perspective, the economics and rationale for what they're doing. I'll give you two examples. I won't mention company names because I don't want to get into trouble, but there are companies who have said, we're all in in the cloud, okay, and they mean public cloud. I love the public cloud. Public cloud has plenty of use cases that are magnificent, that prove just how wonderful it is, but generally, if you were to look at the economic principles behind it, it's variable workload, it's a advantaged unit cost, um, and it's any performance differential one way or another which could happen. And that's what leads you to the balance. The other principle that many people forget is if you can statistically multiplex your own demand, to create flattening, then you don't have the demand spikes that lead you to the cloud. So, without naming names, um, there are some companies that are diversified and yet are all in the public cloud, but my detailed analysis shows that you can actually self-multiplex and get a lot of statistical smoothing, and when you have very flat demand, it's fine to have your own resources, or resources in colo. At the other extreme, you have companies that have well-publicized outages um, due to not just spikes that they couldn't anticipate, but spikes of their own creation, like market promotions. And you're like, wait, this e-tailer's site is down and they're doing this in their own infrastructure. In other words, 
It's like setting fire to your own house. Yeah. You create this market promotion that creates a spike in demand that takes down your own servers and causes a lot of unhappiness. So, <laughs> like, so the basic answer to your question would be understand what you're trying to do and why. Just don't hop on a buzzword. Yeah. Understand right. where private, public, or hybrid really makes sense based on those criteria. Performance differences, Workload spikiness, unit cost differentials, and yeah. maybe ancillary. They call that like getting over your skis and hence face plant right. uh, on the spike. Okay, so let's get back down to the cloud thing because um, you also have your other book, Cloudonomics and Digital Discipline, converging here at this show, OpenStack Silicon Valley, which is racing to build this open cloud software model kind of as an alternative to Amazon, Azure, and other clouds, but at the same time really targeted at the enterprise. Challenge we're hearing is total cost of ownership and complexity. More on the operational side, not so much on the tech side. Really, it's a process issue. Well, I think your one, thoughts on that. One thing to look at is you can't just take a point in time view. At least I don't. I yeah. like you know grew up playing chess, and so you don't worry about your current position. You worry about what's going to be the case five or ten moves down the way, way right? And so, uh, you know, I, I'm not the right person to comment on. Is this particular? Uh, you know, release or component of OpenStack better yeah. or worse than the competition. But what I would say is, um, I think one of the interesting things is that if you go back to the founding of OpenStack, most people predicted that it was basically going to be a dismal failure. And some might say, I won't say who, but some might say that it was like a last ditch effort because if you're a smaller competitor going up against a large deep pocketed mm -hmm. competitor like AWS, which you know, obviously is a leader, obviously, yep. you know, has done great stuff. Well, if you're Microsoft, then you can afford to invest and say, well, look, we've got a lot of our own distinctive competencies and advantages, so we'll come up and be a worthy competitor. But if you're one of the founders or co-founders like of Rackspace. OpenStack, whose name <laughs> I won't mention, um, and you're a smaller competitor, then you know, that's like the old like, coalition of the willing stuff, right? To yeah. try and put up a battle. Most people were like, look, you got these people together, they've got you know, their own diverse interests, it's just you know, smoke and mirrors, and I think most people would say now that they're a credible competitor. Yeah. Obviously, there are people that love OpenStack and don't yeah. like you know, public cloud, you know, pure public cloud, et cetera. But ultimately, what it comes down to, to me, is you know, features can always be fixed or enhanced, portfolios can be expanded, but what is the ultimate architectural principle? And for me, like I've always been, hybrid cloud is the answer. I looked at the economics of it, I looked at other industries, and like if you take the prognostications of some people in the business, they say, for example, super smart people who I respect, that all services go from product to, from custom product to standard product to service to utility to commodity, okay? And it's a very plausible scenario. It just has never happened to anything anywhere, okay? So, you know, if you take water, yes, water is a utility that you can get out of the tap for free, or essentially for free, depending on where you are. Um, and yet, there are people that have managed to decommoditize that and sell water as a product at like $25,000 a bottle. Mm -hmm. Um, if you take the prediction that everything moves to a public service, then we'd all be living in hotels, we'd only be driving around in cabs, nobody would own a, or lease a car, nobody would own a house or at least have a mortgage on it, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, when you look at cross-industry analogies yeah. and when you look at the underlying economics, what it says is, what are you trying to do, right? It's not that an SUV is better than a two-seater roadster yeah. or vice versa. If you're trying to carry cargo, you take the SUV. If you're trying to have a fun drive in the countryside with the top down, you take the roadster. You have spiky demand, or yeah. you don't have the competency to do it yourself, like if you're a smaller business, sure, go cloud, either at SaaS or infrastructure or platform level. But if you can do it yourself, you have the volume economies, the yeah. ability to um, self-modulate workloads, then it's perfectly fine to do it yourself. And ultimately, it's the hybrid architecture that wins yeah. because you wouldn't want me to say, sign here, and if you sign this document, you are forever barred from using a hotel room or forever barred from owning your own house. You want to have flexibility, yeah. and so anything that helps yeah ease that flexibility, whether it's containers or... And every cloud is no general purpose either because every hybrid cloud is 
in the eye, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I might want a red Sportster. Well, exactly. Down. So like, it's, right. it's not a tailor, it's not a product. Hybrid cloud is not a product per se. Right, it's more yeah. of a philosophy, yeah. but I guess my point is that I think that the ultimate race will go to the companies that basically say, our value is not, even though everyone says our value is in the as a service, and there's lots of great things that come from as a service, right? It's somebody else's problem. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. worry about uh, alleged fire, allegedly taking down your reservation systems and stranding thousands of passengers, <laughs> as may have just happened yep. yesterday and today. Um, it's somebody else, at least, you can yell at. Yep. Um, but that said, you know, even Netflix, which is the poster child for public cloud adoption, most people don't realize that the core part of their architecture that delivers streaming services is the Netflix Open Connect appliance, which is a physical box that they own deployed in co-location centers. They need to control that point. Well, it's control, it's uh, backbone bandwidth utilization, yeah. and it's proximity to the edge, yeah. um, which of course the Internet of Things is yeah. also going to be, I think, a major architectural transformation. Everyone's so focused on building these hyperscale data centers and there's a lot of benefit to running distributed queries at the edge or doing data aggregation at the edge or archiving. Um, so I think we're going to see some architectural shifts. Awesome. So I wanted to get your advice for the enterprise. We heard this morning from Jonathan Bryce that a recent survey that uh, OpenStack did, I think of about 1,100 users, indicated that 65% of their clouds are in deployment, 33% um, increase over the year before. But there's also a recent CIO.com survey that reported that over half of enterprises trying to deploy OpenStack clouds are failing. What is your advice for those that have tried that in the open cloud that aren't succeeding? What are the things that you think that they need to do? I'm the wrong person to help people with their implementations of particular stacks. Um, what I would say is these surveys are always challenging for me because it's like, um, you know, 100% of enterprises believe in alien beings. And the reason is because there's at least one person in a 300,000 person enterprise that believes in aliens. So, like how do you count workload distribution for public versus private? Or they private? talk to 200 enterprises and two of them believe in aliens, therefore the percentages skew. It's yeah, the surveys exactly. are all kind of... Right, it, it's very challenging. What, what I would say is that uh, enterprise adoption is not as important as billboard adoption or whatever <laughs> you spell there, um, but that, um, you first need to begin with what are you trying to do now and where are you trying to go and what are your constraints? So, you have legacy software running in TPF on a mainframe that is your core reservation system. You know, you've spent 40 years developing it. It's, you know, a billion lines of code that only three people in the world even know the language that it's in. You're probably not going to rewrite it overnight. You're going to wrapper it, right? Uh, for greenfield stuff, Obviously, you want it to be cloud ready, whether or not you choose to run it in a public cloud or a private cloud, because you want to be able to migrate it over. You know, I think containers are helping to resolve some of the migration issues. You've got intercloud standards that are being worked on more or less by various um, entities, including standards bodies. So, you know, just a matter of seeing how all this stuff unfolds, but you know, the traction certainly seems to be there among the leading public cloud providers, we all know who they are, both in the US and internationally. Um, and you know, OpenStack, certainly from what I've seen, seems like a very credible contender and just gets better with every so release. maybe for those enterprises, go back to the drawing board and really figure out what you're trying to solve for. Probably a bit easier stuff than done, but maybe lead there rather than starting with tech. Well, right, as opposed to, just to put a, you know, a point on this, the, you know, which, I'm not going to say what percentage of the time happens, but the CEO is on a flight somewhere, pulls out the in-flight magazine, and reads an article about enterprise going to the cloud, goes to the CEO and says, you know, I want, why aren't we doing this, right? So, I mean, it makes sense, obviously, but that's not the rationale for why it makes sense. It makes sense based on things like user experience due to geo dispersion and latency reduction slash response time reduction. It makes sense based on the ability to handle spikes and still continue to perform. It makes sense to be able to do load testing. Yeah. It makes sense to do data center migration. It makes sense to, you know, if you don't have the competence to run your own data center, which let's face yeah. it, most yeah. enterprises don't, 
you know, so, and the best and the brightest are being snapped up by the biggest providers, so. Well, Joe, we're excited that you're here on theCUBE. First of all, we're a big fan of your work, and certainly, like Dave and I, make a lot of predictions on theCUBE, and when they come out right, we're all proud of ourselves, and we pat ourselves on the back. You've made some good calls, certainly in the book, both books, very solid. What are you working on now? What's, ex what's exciting you today? Uh, obviously, the nice trajectory up with what your work has been done. There's great analysis going on in the marketplace. What's getting you jazzed up right now? I've just been running around like a crazy person giving keynotes like, you know, on multiple continents in any given <laughs> week. Um, and it's just like, it's hard to even think about what's next. But, since you ask, um, I am probably going to write a book on disruptive innovation because I don't think the Clayton Christensen model quite gets it yeah. right. As important and brilliant as it was, there are just some issues with the model where it's a great model, but again, if you actually say what is disruptive, the Christensen answer is a little bit old. counter to, so, well, there was just a piece he did that explained why the Apple iPhone is not disruptive and why Uber is not disruptive. And if you look at that and why Netflix was not disruptive, and so you say, really? Like, okay, well, is the problem with your special definition of disruptive or is the problem with some subtlety in their innovation process? And I have a belief as to yeah, where I that is Yeah, I think we can see why. where you're going to come out on that. <laughs> Excited to follow that. So I got to ask you, on your keynote tour, what's jumping out? What's the, let's take a big data approach. What's the pattern recognition? What's, high, what's, what's surfacing out of what people get excited about, what's the touch points? Well, you know, you're here in the US, I'm here in the US, and so we tend to talk about AWS and Facebook and Google and Microsoft and IBM and you know, a handful of others yeah. and all those shifts. The biggest thing is China. So I've been to China five or six times in the last four or five months um, and really, first of all, gotten a sense of the energy out there, the entrepreneurialism, you know, they are with cloud right now in terms of an energy level, if I can call it that, um, back where like a few years ago, it was like, wait, this is new, it's the future, it's big. The government is, you know, investing and, uh, you know, supporting infrastructure mm -hmm. and it's more of a government-private partnership. You've got the really big companies, right, that make Google and AWS look like, you know, SMBs, because um, like, yeah. if you take Tencent for example, so I just keynoted their event um, in Shenzhen uh, two weeks ago, and they are just huge, and it's an interesting, different constellation of services. So QQ, okay, is their sort of email, WeChat is their like cross between Messenger and Twitter, um, and they're at 600 million users plus for those services. And they're just getting started, okay, that's the de facto platform. So if you look here, you've got Facebook, you would argue is probably more of the social media and messaging platform. They're not in public infrastructure, enterprise cloud services. But then you've got Tencent, which is the number one gaming provider, you know, and they've got all this. So they're a very serious contender. And I don't think we pay enough attention um, to what they're doing and moreover, yeah. These are smart people, right? Yeah. And you've got a lot of the people that sort of left the PRC, let's call it during the diaspora, 20 years ago, became tech leaders here. They're now going back there. And you know anything that says China is just copying yeah. the US, and they're not innovative, misses the point. They're super entrepreneurial, yeah. super innovative. And certainly and the capital's flowing nicely too. Absolutely. All right, final, final question. You're getting the hook here, but it's just a great hey. interview. We're going to continue. One more question. You mentioned chess. You got to know what Checkmate looks like to play chess. So tell us about the chessboard for the suppliers out there. If we're living in a buyer-led environment, that's what it seems to be. The users are in charge. Choices are everywhere, horizontal, non-linear, consumption of content, and all kinds of services being bundled together. Complete radical departure from the old way. If you're a CEO who wants to buy into something, <laughs> what's Checkmate look like for them? Well, you know, I'll tell you, the, the challenge for all companies operating in this period of transformation of the entire industry is just, this is tough, okay? This is like, um, 
you know, I don't know, I don't know if about history, but Carthage when the Romans <laughs> came in or something, right? And so you have these empires that have existed for a long time and it's really hard for them to change. So, you know, without picking on anyone, telcos, for example, right? And I was at AT&T for a long time. And so, you know, we were doing this stuff back in the early 90s, right? You had easy World Wide Web. Um, and, you know, now, you know, I think probably AWS and Google and Microsoft and IBM are viewed as a little bit more capable in the field. Um, and so you say, like, you've got the natural capabilities, competencies, infrastructure, customer relationships, right? The cloud is a network-centric service, right? You have no cloud without a network, and so that's a natural. And then you also have the legacy hardware vendors who are giving it a college try, um, but you know, you're just undergoing the shift yeah. to open compute and open stack, and you know, it's tough and especially if you're trying to deal with Wall Street and you know you need new firm skills and competencies and you got to understand the shift in buying behavior and you know it's not just the tech companies it's do you think Honeywell ever said okay you know when they do their competitor audits of like you know who they're selling against at Lowe's or wherever you go to buy a Honeywell thermostat gee I wonder if we should also put on our strategic analysis, the possible scenario that two guys leave Apple and create a new cloud-connected thermostat, right? So no matter what industry yeah. you're in, wine, it was just in Napa Valley for a few days. Fruition Sciences is doing these irrigation centers, on, irrigation sensors on grapevines that are transforming thousands of years of best practices in winemaking. Yeah. And like the net result is you get higher quality grapes that generate higher quality wine with less irrigation. So the world is on its head right now. Everything's being tossed upside down. It is. And I would be, you know, if you are not scared to death of the big US, Chinese, and Japanese competitors that are in here and thinking, you know what, we got to figure out what we're going to do here, they're going to eat our lunch, then you should be basically, you may as well just resign now, because you're either going to resign or be resigned. Innovation, technology, business models, completely upside down, flipped on its head. Exactly. Almost the opposite of what they are today. Exactly. Great work, thanks for spending some time <laughs> and sharing. Thanks, Sean. Great thanks, insight Lisa. on theCUBE, of course. Great to see you well, in person. As and we'll be following your uh, next step, and certainly the books are amazing. Joe Weinman here inside theCUBE, breaking it down, laying out the chessboard for us, and looking five moves ahead. As always on theCUBE here in Silicon Valley where innovations always flow and then extracting the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE, we'll be right back.